Hi, this is Mama Dr. Tochi with today's class on the 6th, 7th, and 8th book of Moses. This is some literature that um, is very popular, has been used by a lot of people around the world, and is said to be from Moses. But in today's class, we're going to go briefly into an overview of what this thing is, how it came about and the practical applications for us in spirituality, okay? So, go get that drink, get the snack, get the notebook, get the pad. We're going to have us some forbidden fruit, and we're going to take some time to bite into this fruit, to eat it and to digest it, okay? So make sure you have time for this class, all right? Don't try to multitask and do other things in this class because I want you to learn something that you can use to make changes in your life. Thank you for coming back. A little bit of housekeeping as usual. If you are a subscriber to my channel, thank you so much for supporting me and my content. If you are a member, a double thank you to you for using your funds to help me to help me create content like this. I couldn't do it without you. If you'd like to join and become a member of my channel, please click the join button below this video. If you don't see that join button and just see a subscribe button, just realize that membership is not yet available in your country or region yet. There are other ways uh, you can also enjoy uh, spiritual products and services from me. I encourage you to go to my website, tochi.us, T-O-C-H-I.us to see what you can get there for yourself. I have eBooks, I have online courses, I have spiritual practice coaching, I have consultations, divinations, just, just a wealth of information. Soaps and cleansing products and chalks and I don't even remember everything I have. It's a lot <laughs> on my website. If anybody's trying to reach out to you using my name or my image, claiming to be me, asking you to do business with them on WhatsApp or in Facebook, sending you text messages and things of that nature, sending you threats. Um, I think the latest thing now is telling people that they have a curse on them or there, there is some black magic or some of that nonsense. If anybody reaches out to you, threatening you or trying to scare you, telling you that there's some hex on you, that there's some curse on you, and that they're the only ones who could take it off of you, it is a scam. I repeat, it is a scam. Do not believe them. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter how often they say it. It's a scam. Scam, scam, scam. Do not fall for it. All right? True spiritual practitioners are too busy. They don't have time to be writing random people they don't know, you know, with information. You know, they don't have time. We don't have time. Imagine me going online and looking up people at random, people I don't know, to tell them that, hey, there's a curse on you. It's a scam, okay? Don't fall for it. So let's get into today's class. I have some notes here. I'm going to be referring to my notes occasionally. The sixth and seventh book of Moses, starting with that, has been known in some places as the Black Bible, okay? This, these writings or this literature, the writings, they came out of Europe in the 1500s, uh, sorry, in the 1800s, okay? And the sixth and seventh book of Moses, as well as the eighth, were actually compilations from earlier magical works. Okay, L let me let me really condense this so that we can understand this and move on. People were doing magic in Europe despite Christianity, and even when Islam rose uh, and came into Europe from the Middle East, people were still doing magic. With and additionally, with the rise of Islam and and the propagation of Islam into Europe, Arabian magic was carried along. And remember, some Arabian magic that they were doing also 
fueled or was foundational to Egyptian magic, or sorry, was foundational to Greek magic. Now bear with me, okay, because I'm trying to trace this here. So, and Greek magic was traced from Egyptian magic or Kemetic magic. So ultimately, what, we're, what you can see in some of these write-ups is information, magical spells that were pulled from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, pulled into Greece, especially when the Greeks were going to Egypt to learn. And then the Greeks, when they got taken over by the Romans, and then some of that got Latinized, which was the language of, of Rome. And then when, when Islam started rising, they already, in, in the Arabs, the Arabian uh, region, they already had their own magic. And so with the rise of Islam, and they had their scholars, their magicians, also creating their own uh, uh, magical spells, working things out, creating their own grimoires. A grimoire is a, spook, a book of spells, okay? So, and then the influence of that. So, but all of that started coming into Europe, okay? And so here you had people who um, were practicing Christianity, uh, were interested in uh, Kabbalah, which is the uh, mystical aspect of Judaism, you know, or of the Jewish faith. And so this, all of this in Europe, especially in places like Italy and, and Germany, not the modern Italy and Germany we know today, because then they used to have vastly different territories. People, the, the people were so interested, and they were experimenting and writing and getting, you know, information from here and there, trying out all kinds of magic. This was the background, the context within which the books of the sixth and seventh and eighth books of Moses were written. Some of the sources were not just from Arabian magic, Jewish magic, or Kabbalistic magic, or Egyptian or Kemetic magic. Some of it even came from ancient Chaldean and Babylonian magic. Inside, you will also see uh, references to Canaanite uh, magic. The, 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 the Canaanites were the people that existed again in that Middle Eastern region before the rise of the Israelites. But here's the deal, okay? I know you can go on Google, you can go on YouTube, and you can saturate yourself with information about where the nitty-gritty, who wrote what, when, and how it was written, and how it was put together. But this is what we need to know here. When people were putting together the folks, the guys who were putting together the sixth and seventh books of Moses, or what they call the sixth, seventh books of Moses, and the eighth books of Moses, Remember that these people were still under the influence or living in regions controlled by the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church frowned upon magic, even though there was a lot of magical things, magical work, spiritual work going on within the Catholic Church itself. But you could not come out in those days and just openly say, I'm a magician, or I, I'm a sorcerer, or I'm a witch, or a wizard. You could not. If you did, you could lose your life. There were inquisitions, and so on and so forth, okay? People would attack you. Same thing that happens today with, uh, with fundamentalist people. We see that even today. If you happen to be amongst fundamentalist people, I don't care what religion they are, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Jew, Jewish, Buddhist, you know, whatever, Hindus, okay? If you come out and say, you know, you believe in magic or you work spells or things like that, they can attack you and, and translate you to the next realm of existence, if you know what I mean, okay? So, so just as pe people today are concerned about the safety of their life due to spiritual freedom, it was more so back in the day. So in order to have these grimoires, these books of spells, to be able to freely share them 
work with them, discuss them. They had to call them holy books. And it was not uncommon during these days for so many of these grimoires to be published. I mean, of course, the 6th and 7th and 8th books of, of Moses are popular now, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about how they became so popular. But there were so many more in addition to the 6th, 7th, and 8th books of Moses. They were the, the keys of Solomon. And then later that, uh, with the Golden Dawn, became the greater and lesser keys of Solomon. Uh, they, they, they were uh, the angels uh, of the uh, Shem Hamporash, um, you know, and then the the demons of the Goetia. So, you know, and then the, the 70, 72 angels. There were so many work, so much work done about 72 angels. And those 72 angels came about from the 72 names of gods. And then someone said, well, if you have 72 good angels, you have to have 72 demons instead of doing the work. And that's how the demons of the Goetia came out. So I'm just using this as examples. There were hundreds, literally hundreds of these grimoires put out there. I mean, uh, some I have here, um, there was even um, uh, the Occultia Philosophia, okay? Sefer Raziel, Heptameron, Arbitel of Magic, Babylonian Talmud. I mean, there was just so, just imagine yourself in this period of time. There's just this book coming out, or, or well, they were called books, they were grimoires, you know, this one coming out and that one coming out. But in order to have them safely uh, published, safely shared, even before mass printing, people used to write this out by hand. They had people who were literate who could write this out by hand. And so they would copy it. And, you know, and someone would get a copy and they will make a copy of a copy. And everything was handwritten. All the seals, everything was sketched, you know, by hand. Everything done by hand. So this was the environment, the con uh, you know, the environment, the context within which a lot of these kind of literature were put out. And so we come to discover that books like the 6th, 7th, and 8th Book of Moses are grimoires. They're, they're a book of spells that people put together from their experimentation. And you, when you study, if you take, I mean, it is so easy today to get copies of the 6th and 7th Book of Moses. I don't know so much about the 8th, but the 6th and 7th have become so copy, uh, common. There are PDF copies everywhere. I mean, you can get some for free. Back in my day, when I was younger, I had a copy of the 6th and 7th. I want to say I was 14 when I got my copy and that was a long time ago okay that was a very very long time ago and it used to be considered precious oh you know you have this sixth and seventh it is so precious it's great for magical working now it the book has become common and um the seals that are in there and from other books like the uh, the the keys of solomon are, have been used and are still being used extensively in African American uh, folk magic, even in uh, uh, American hoodoo magic. Very common in in the Caribbean magic. It used to be big in West Africa, especially Anglophone West Africa, and by Anglophone West Africa, I mean. English-speaking West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, parts of Cameroon, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia. You know, it, because again, once printing started and copies started proliferating and people were using, they started sending, you know, everybody wanted to use it. So the first, sixth, and seventh book of Moses uh, was uh, produced by... Johann Skybel, I think it was in in, uh, in the 1800s, okay, mid 1800s, okay, and in Germany, and then it was translated to English uh, in the late 1800s. By 1880, the English copy started coming out, and a lot of um, English-speaking magicians started using it, okay. 
The sixth and seventh book, when you look at the preface in the book, it will say um, that these were the secrets that Moses used in Exodus. So in your regular Bible or, or Torah, you have your, your first five books. Uh, the Pentateuch, which is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what most people know about, especially Christians. Okay, those are the books they know about. These are uh, these five books are also referenced in the Quran. So you will see the same stories that were told in these five books were also are also represented in the Quran. But then people ask the question, well, how was Moses able to do all the work he did, all the magic that he did, um, or to use the religious or Christian terminology, the miracles that he did? And so these people who were collecting and studying magical traditions from around the world now said, okay, here's the sixth and seventh book of Moses. These are secret books that contain the secret information that Moses used to do miracles, you know, divide and cross the Red Sea, and so on and so on and so forth. But how do we know that it is not what Moses used? Glad you asked that question. When you read these books, you will find out that the, the prayers, the invocations, the evocations, conjurations are in a mixture of languages, including Latin, Hebrew, um, and of course English for the English translation, German for the German compilation. And so you look at that and you say, well, did Moses speak Latin? Okay, because even when you look at the German version, there's Latin in it you, and Hebrew in it. And when you look at the English version, you will see Latin and Hebrew and some strange languages in, the, in there. Some scholars have determined that some of the languages or terminology used in these books is actually um, Egyptian, which is Kemetic, and Chaldean and Babylonian. And when we talk of Chaldeans, the Chaldees, and, and Babylon, and the Babylonians, these were folks in the Middle East that predated Moses. They were, they were existing and doing their magic, astrology, whole bunch of things well before Moses. So, and then the other thing when you read these books, you, there, there's a lot of contradiction. Okay, you might have... Uh, one image saying, well, here's the breastplate of Moses that, you know, the inscription that Moses had on his chest when he was leading the Israelites out of Israel and divided uh, the Red Sea. And then on another page, you'll say, well, here's the breastplate of Moses. And you'll see that the first breastplate inscription and design is different from the second. And then there's a third one. So that one lets you know that, e that this is now a compilation this this book or these books are compilations from a variety of books where someone just sat down and said, you know what, let us compile this and see if we can put this together and make sense in a way that people can use it. I'm also made to understand that in the 1990s, uh, there was a, another guy that took it upon himself to start saying, well, let me start cleaning this up, correcting mistakes spelling mistakes, pronunciation mistakes, and things of that nature. There are a lot of mistakes in this book because remember I mentioned this, that before printing, okay, people used to copy this thing out by hand. So it's like I would have a copy. My copy already had mistakes, okay, because my copy was someone else's copy and it was done by hand. And so you would come to me and say, hey, can I have your sixth and seventh book or can I have your uh, uh, Arbital of Magic or whatever grimoire I was collecting at the time? Because people would collect these things. 
And so I'd give you my copy and then you would sit by candle like folks, there wasn't electricity in these days. <laughs> so people use lamp light, candle light, you know, oil lamps and things of that nature. And they would sit there at night. So you look at this one and write it out by hand. Look at the other one, write it out by hand. Look at this one and write it out by hand. So of course there were going to be mistakes. And you'll see drawings, names, um, something might look to you like it's this, but it's actually something else. And so that's why when you take your time to go through the six, seventh uh, books of Moses and even the eighth book of Moses, you will find a lot of errors. Okay. You will find variations on, on the same thing. You will see a uh, uh, mention made of an angel or a spirit, because remember again, in these books, uh, the claim was that these were the spirits that, that Moses used to do a lot of his magical works and to do his spells. So you will see even in the same sentence where they will say, repeat the name of this spirit seven times, the person would not even duplicate the name exactly seven times. It might be Bob, 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 Bib, Bab, Babe, you know, something like that. And so... You're looking at it, okay, going, okay, I'm calling on spirit Bob, but is now mentioning Bib, Bab, Boob. And then you assume that these are names of other additional spirits. No, it's just a writing error. Okay. The other thing to mention about these books, okay, not only did the 6th, 7th, and 8th uh, books of Moses come from compilation from uh, compilations of other grimoires that were floating around at the time but the 6th the 6th 7th and 8th book of Moses served as a foundational grimoire for additional magical workings and writings that came after they started being compiled and so that's why when you come to say uh you look at the the Dutch hexmeisters uh, these are the Dutch people who settled in the Pennsylvania region of United States back when uh, America was being colonized. Um, they used this. They used the, the spells, the magical workings and spells in these books. But they also adapted it according to their Christian beliefs and other folk magic with which, uh, which they brought with them from the Netherlands or from Holland. When you look at African-American uh, uh, folk magic, you will see that the use of the 6th and 7th book of Moses, as well as uh, the, the Keys of Solomon, is also mixed with um, African uh, magic and African uh, spells and, and spiritual workings. They mix it, you know, to use it to make it work. Same thing in American hoodoo. Now, when you go to West Africa, and let me speak to my experience, um, I know that um, when, when I was introduced to the 6th and 7th and 8th books of Moses, I'm talking about long, long, long time ago, all right, when I was a young teenager, um, I learned about how to work it from an Anglican bishop. And he used to have Kabbalah classes in his home, and we would go there uh, and you know sit there and and take these classes. I think I was the only female then, you know. I was a tomboy back then, and um, as we're learning, uh, we had to learn how to pronounce the names. Um, he he would say to us, it was very important to learn how to pronounce the names correctly. Uh, there was a lot of mixing up with the keys of Solomon with other magical texts. Um, I also remember from personal experience that there was quite a bit of uh, experimentation. So let's say, for instance, you have the, the keys of Solomon, where um, that one is a grimoire that is reputed to have come from Solomon, and that Solomon gave it as a secret to his son Rehoboam. Uh, Rehoboam, okay, and uh, asked that it be hidden, um, and, then, and then later some, some folks went to excavate King Solomon's uh, tomb and found it there, and you know, and so on and so on and so forth. But 
to use these things, he was saying that we had to learn how to pronounce the names correctly. If you don't pronounce the angelic names or the demonic names or the spirit names uh, correctly, then it was not going to work. The other thing that we had to learn while using these books was to uh, know the correct accoutrements that went with these uh, with these uh, grimoires or with, or with these magical workings. What do I mean by the accoutrements? Uh, there were certain robes you had to wear uh, and they had to be a certain color sewn in a certain way. Uh, there were certain, uh, there's a certain way you had to uh, construct your altar. Um, and certain things had to be on the altar, like a sword and a chalice, a wand, um, a mirror. And then uh, you had to go through long periods of fasting and cleansing. So to cleanse you physically, to make you worthy and powerful enough to call upon these spirits or these entities. Um, you also had to have a uh, sufficient space within which to do these magical working. So, um, you had to have a big room with space where you would not be disturbed and enough floor space where you could start inscribing circles and start writing inscriptions on those circles. And these inscriptions were more often than not either in Hebrew or Latin. I think most of the time they were in Hebrew. And these circles and stuff were pulled again from these grimoires. These circles you had to draw on the ground, um, around yourself, around your altar and stuff was meant to protect you from the spirits that you were evoking. Uh, the target of using these books was actually to call these spirits uh, or to evoke them into physical appearance. So not just, um, you know, the way you would pray in church today or the way you pray in your altar and you would just pray, close your eyes and say what you need to say and go about your business. No. When you were working this magic, the idea was that you had to or you were supposed to evoke these, these spirits into physical manifestation. They'll be standing in front of you in all their horrific glory, whether they had 10 horns and 15 eyes or, you know, or they were hairy or slimy or looked like something like aliens, whatever the case may be, which we were told they looked like that. And then when you had them and you would also have a magical circle inscribed where you would bind them and then command them. And then you would use the sixth and seventh, the, you know, the writings in the sixth and seventh book or the eighth book of Moses or the other ones like the key of Solomon. And then you would, of course, be yelling at them and commanding them and constraining them and getting an agreement from them that they were going to do exactly what you wanted them to do. So you come to understand that the actual working, if we were to look at the actual working of the 6th and 7th book of Moses, the 8th book of Moses, the Keys of Solomon and, and books like that, that it, it was actually very tedious. It's not, it, it, it's not as sexy as is being put today. Oh, just uh, rub one or two things and just say a prayer and go about your business. No, there was a lot of work to it. You had to be doing it in the right month, right week, right day, right hour. So uh, let's say, for instance, you were doing a love spell. You would do it on a Friday, which was considered the day of Venus. But you also do it in the hour of Venus. And then there was, there was a chart for that. And that chart exists still today. You can go online and find that. That will tell you for each hour of the day which astrological sign is is dominant so you would want to do for instance a love working on the venus day in the venus hour okay and then if you really wanted to be a really really um ensure that what you're doing is going to work well not only do you have to do it on a venus day on the venus hour uh but you would also have to pay attention to which planets or in conjunction to each other, which ones were, were trying to each other, which is favorable, which ones are sextile to each other, which are favorable, and, and which one were antagonistic to each other. Okay, so it can get very complicated very quickly. I also remember, and, and I think uh, that procession still exists, 
um, you know, within the the West African Anglophone community or even African community, let me just say generally, the African Anglophone community that use these kind of books, that these books are dangerous. Um, if you handle them incorrectly, you will go insane, you will go mad. Uh, or, or just die and, and things of that nature. And so there was a lot of fear put into people who didn't understand what these books were, or even if they got a copy and they were reading it, because it's these books are not logical. Get yourself a copy and you can see. They're not, they're not even in any really logical order, <laughs> okay? Uh, one minute it could be talking about this and the other minute talking about that, then somewhere in the middle it will say, as previously referred, and then you're like, previously referred where? Okay, so um, so people will read this, they wouldn't understand it, and, people, and, and then the people who are using these books will say, well, you know, if you don't use this correctly, you can go crazy. So those are the things that I think we need to know. I know this class is a little bit on the longer side, but this is such a huge area. It's such a huge area because even these books are being used today. People have the impression that they actually came from Moses. They did not come from Moses. If, if nothing else, just understand this. These books never came from Moses. Moses had nothing to do with them. They are a mixture of, of magic spells from different cultures. Many of those magic spells predate Christianity. Uh, many of them predate Islam. Uh, there are a lot of errors in these books because back in the day they used to be handwritten, copied out by hand. So to get a copy, you would actually have to find someone who could write. Because remember then, not everybody knew how to write. You'd have to find someone to copy out, make a copy out for you by hand. And that could take months, okay? You can't copy a whole book in a day. I mean, it would take you months to create a book. And then if there were mistakes in it, so be it. So, you know... And, and so this made it that um, people today who are creating books based on these ancient grimmers, like there's, um, uh, I'm sure some of you must have heard of the Gallery of Magic and they have a whole, I mean, library of books and different kinds of, of, of magical spells and, and, and seals sigils of angels and demons and conjurations again the people who put out those book in the gallery those books in the gallery of magic okay they went through the trouble of hunting down the original grimoire so looking at grimoires that were even older than the sixth and seventh book of moses and they went looking for these grimoires and they're like we want we're going to go around the world and go to uh, um, libraries, ancient libraries in uh, in Europe, and we want to see the original for ourselves and collect the information, refine it, clear it, clarify it, and understand it, and then put it forth in new material that people can use. And so, so that's why um, you you have modern books now. People just take these uh, seals, clean them up, try to make them understandable. Uh, oftentimes experiment with the seals themselves and the angelic names or the spirit names themselves to see will this thing work or will not work. For you, will this work? Now, <laughs> here we come to the crux of the matter. Should you be running out there to go look for uh, the 6th and 7th book of Moses or the 8th book of Moses? Okay. Well... If you're comfortable with with Judaism, Kabbalah, uh, Christian mysticism, because a lot of these two, um, you will see Christian influences, references to Jesus Christ, references to, yeah, Christian references, because remember again, people were compiling these things and mixing it up with whatever they got, you know, to do the, the work they do. If you're comfortable with that, then by all means, you can go ahead and start experimenting with it. However, we have found out that um, if, if you do your due diligence, if you understand 
um, the fundamentals of magic and spells, um, you can devise your own shortcuts for using uh, literature such as the 6th, 7th, and 8th book of Moses, okay? But you have to have a good foundation in Kabbalah and, and, um, and magic to look at it and say, okay, here, this part is useful and that part is not useful and I'm just going to do this. The other thing also uh, to note is that when you're using these books to make your own seals, you're using the the seals, the sigils that were purportedly uh, obtained from these spirits or angels or demons. You have to be in a spiritually protective and spiritually strong state. You can't just be running up in there and be calling on spiritual entities that you do not know. Because some of these entities are not... Jewish, they're not Christian. They have been Christianized or Jew made into uh, Jewish entities by adding E-L to the end of their names, okay? So you will have a Raphael, Mikael, and things of that nature, Gabriel. But some of these entities being called upon and invoked actually predate Christianity. And it, it's important that you know what you are working with. Don't make any assumptions that, oh, well, it's in the sixth and seventh book. I'm seeing the name of Jesus written here, the name of Moses or name of Solomon or whomever, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jehovah's written here, um, uh, you know, and all these holy names of God are written here, so it's okay, fine. No, you could be invoking ancient spirits, ancient spirit guides, ancient spiritual entities that actually have certain protocols, terms and conditions for calling on them. Okay. For most people, when they use, whether they're reading it aloud or they go through uh, creating a special temple or altar to start using 6th and 7th Book of Moses, or the eighth book of Moses, for most people it will not work. Let me just be plain. For most people it will not work. Why? Because they they are not pronouncing the names correctly. They don't have the spiritual authority to call these entities or these spiritual entities. Um, they're even using um, using wrong wrong scripts. Okay. The you know the the method of calling upon these spirits and asking them to even the the seals that you might be copying from these books might be wrong, it might be incorrect, it might be incomplete or have errors in it. So if that's the case, nothing is going to happen. So for most people, these books are safe. You can read them, do what you want to do with them. You know, just you know, understand how people used to work magic back in the day. Uh, but if you are a spiritually active person and you're doing a lot of spiritual work, you need to pay attention if you decide you're going to work with these books and make sure that you are using authentic rituals to call upon these spiritual entities and that you are not calling upon them for frivolity. Go and get me a burger. Uh, my ex took away my my dog go and get my dog back or go poke at my ex's eye or some silly thing like that okay um some of these entities are so ancient they used to control regions not just take care of people certain people but some of them are so ancient they took care of regions and areas and they have no business with you. You can call them from now to tomorrow. They're not going to respond to you because their area of functioning is in regions, huge regions and huge areas. Okay, they, Their job is not to help individuals. So if you call on them, they're not even going to pay attention to you. They'll just ignore you. Okay, They'll be like, whatever. All right. I do encourage people to get these books sort of books and read them, even if it's just for academic curiosity to see how people used to think back in the day and how and how 
challenging doing magical work and spell work used to be compared to how it is now. And also to use it to understand how magic and spell work and spirituality evolves, you know, and how people can take uh, languages, different languages and words from different languages and put them together and create um, uh, rituals or spells to help them achieve their objectives. Okay, So I think I covered the major, major points I wanted to uh, mention. I'm just looking at my notes here really quickly. Um, yeah, these are the, the, the major points I wanted to cover because this is a huge area. It's not something that can be covered in and you know one hour i mean but i'm just trying to give an overview and enough information for you to make a decision is this something that you want to uh get involved with and to start working with okay if you are averse to christianity judaism uh and uh, uh, islam religion like that uh you can leave it alone but they're working or not working really doesn't depend upon your belief let's put it this way if you have everything right if you have all your ducks lined up in a row, it should work for you, regardless of what your beliefs are. But some of these grimoires will tell you there, even in the 6th and 7th book of Moses, if you don't believe, it's not going to work. If you're not a believer, some of them even come out and say, if you don't confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and, uh, you know, uh, ask for the blood and the Holy Spirit. Because you men you'll see them in these grimoires. Some of them will say, oh, uh, um... You know, I call upon Jesus to do this and God to do this and the Holy Spirit to do this. I call upon this this angel and this scent and whatnot. Understand that this is the flavoring given to the scripts by the people of that time because they were Christians. You know, they were Christians. And sometimes they had to sprinkle these things in there to protect themselves. Okay. But the people who knew what they were doing sometimes knew what to cut out and what to use from inside there. But because they were handing out this book, people were circulating this book, they had to sprinkle these things in there so that, you know, the the leaders of the church back then wouldn't come back and say, wait a minute, what is this? You know, yeah. So um, they had to write these books. They had to use biblical names uh, to in order to disseminate it. Oh, this is Moses' book. And the original grimoires never had the, the authors' names on them. They would not put down the names of the authors. You didn't want to do that. You, if you were putting together your grimoire, your book of spells, and you wanted other people to use it, you would call it, oh, this is the book of, 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 uh, this is the book of Esther. The secret book of Esther. Okay? As revealed to, and then you'd use a pen name. Because again, persecution, religious persecution was real back in the day, okay? And if you were found doing magic, you could uh, actually not make it. <laughs> All right. So I know today's class is a lengthy class. Uh, it's lengthy for a good reason. I hope that you've learned something from this quick <laughs> overview. I know it kind of looks long, but it's really a quick overview about how these books work all right so let me know in the comment sections what you think about the sixth seventh and eighth book of moses okay have you used them have you heard about them would you be interested in checking them out and seeing what you can do with them as for me nowadays in the 21st century i like to keep things simple i just go straight to my spiritual crew um and tell them what i want and tell them what i need and have them give me <laughs> guidance and direction straight without having to be wearing no robes and hats and carrying a sword. Where is my sword? I thought I had a sword here I was going to use for today's class. But anyway, uh, carrying a sword and a wand and, and uh, trying to read uh, some script that I'm not even sure that I'm pronouncing correctly. It's a lot easier for me to go directly to my spiritual crew. And that's for what I want, all right? We're thankful to our creator, our guardian spirits, our ancestors, spirit guides, and all those in the unseen realms who teach us what we need to know so that we can have fun while we are on this side. Ashe.